good for it. I don't think we're good bad for everything. We're pretty good for making coffee. Uh, probably as good as Brazil. But so far, I don't know of one country that has solved the cardiovascular disease epidemic by selling coffee to other countries. So definitely, we have to put our bet somewhere else. So talking about cardiovascular disease control, there is a strategic plan for NCD control in the country, uh, whose general objective is to stop the increase and reduce by 5% the morbidity and mortality from non clinical diseases. I don't know where this 5% came from, and I don't know what they mean by stop the increase. The specific objectives, uh, first of all, are to define the epidemiologic profile to strengthen the local healthcare system capacity to respond and treat NCDs, to intervene on the determinant risk factors to promote a healthy lifestyle, to support NCD research, to develop NCD treatment and prevention guidelines. All of this sounds very good on paper, but unfortunately the program has no budget or funding for research or implementation. Um, now, continuing with the prevention side, there's something that is positive about Guatemala, and I think several of the countries here have done as well. Probably you're all familiar with Fremen Conversion on Tobacco Control, which is the WHO treaty in order to halt the tobacco epidemic. Well, Guatemala has signed and ratified the treaty. Uh, unfortunately, and even though we are part of the treaty, we still have no national smoking prevalence survey and no longitudinal data. This gives us a very, very weak scenario in how to argue for a strong tobacco control program. Uh, so as a result, we have stand, uh, scanned progress in implementation of the SCPC, and believe it or not, we are the only country in the world where tobacco is not taxed. There's not absolutely one penny you know, on tobacco taxes. Having that in mind, at UNICAR, we came up with the idea of designing a chronic disease control research fellowship program. First of all, tobacco is the number one risk factor, not only for heart disease, but for all non-communicable diseases. So we, we aim to establish, through mentorship, a new generation of young researchers. Mentorship will lead to capacity building, and will also have a mentoring, we will develop a mentoring culture that will ultimately have, have a multiplier effect. We're trying to change individuals, organizations, institutions, and to build networks within Guatemala and outside of Guatemala. Our project right now is being funded by the International Development Research Center in Ottawa, Canada. And the data I'm going to show you afterwards is data that has come out through this fellowship program. One of the projects we did is we compared how much internal medicine physicians are providing preventive services. By preventive services, I mean tobacco screening, colonoscopy screening, uh, hypertension screening, and tobacco cessation uh, uh, advice. And we compare them with the UN, US Preventive Services Task Force Grade A and grade, grade B Preventive Services, where there's enough evidence to recommend them. First of all, you see that those, these are the Ministry of Health guidelines for uh, NCD control. They do not mention lipid disorders, and do not, they do not mention colorectal cancer. This in and of itself is a finding that the, that the Ministry of Health guidelines are not evidence-based. And second, you see that our staff are doing pretty good in terms of they knowing that they should be recommending it. Right? So at least they're pretty well educated on why they should recommend, even though they're not following the Guatemala Ministry of Health guidelines. Interestingly enough, when we ask them about grade D or I preventive services, these are the ones that there's not enough evidence to recommend them, or they should even be discouraged from implementing. Here, interesting. Ministry of Health does not mention coronary heart disease screen, does not mention diabetes, does not mention prostate cancer, and it does counsel, it does include healthy diet counseling. Like in the, other, in the previous slides, most, most internal medicine residents are doing the right thing, unfortunately, with preventive services that maybe, maybe sh they shouldn't even be recommended. Now the other question we ask is why they're not doing it. And this is not a surprise to any of us, and it's probably similar across countries. They don't have time, or they don't have enough money, or the patients don't have enough money to pay for this type of treatment, or prevention strategies. Now talking a little bit about tobacco use, and uh, as Dr. Fernandez Brito showed, they have actually longitudinal data on smoking prevalence in Cuba, we don't. So we undertook the task of uh, doing the largest tobacco survey based in the country right now, and we surveyed 1,300 field workers in, uh, in rural Guatemala. 
Most of them have never smoked. Uh, however, there was a 44% that they were, they have actually tried at least, and 65% of them continued smoking. And as expected, mean age of starting was 17 years of age. Prevalence was very, about, about a quarter in male and about 1% in female. Now, what is it that makes, and what is it what's so interesting about smoking in rural areas? That is not only about if you're a female or a, or a male. It is depending on religion. Catholics were more likely to be smokers compared to Protestants. I'm not saying that everybody should be turned Catholic and this will, this will take care of the tobacco epidemic. Uh, education, those that didn't know how to read and write, were twice as likely to be smokers, excuse me, to be smokers than those uh, that had more than six years of education. This is really important for very poor countries such as Guatemala. The higher the educational level, the lower the smoking prevalence will be. And this probably reflects as well in the occupation. The more technical the occupation, the lower the smoking prevalence. So there's something to be said by tobacco and poverty, not only because it increases the risk of be becoming a smoker, but also smoking itself is a reason to become more poor. Uh, this is just a snapshot because you can track the tobacco epidemic depending on how much decision on smoking in each country. And this data might be a little bit outdated, but this hopefully this percentages have gone down. Uh, you can see the U.S., who is probably ahead in the controlling the tobacco epidemic, has its lowest smoking prevalence than Mexico, Argentina, since it still has a pretty high smoking prevalence in physicians, just like uh, uh, Chile. Guatemala is not that bad, just like, it, just like Costa Rica. Now, the other project that I'm really going to briefly talk about is about smoke-free environments. This is one of the most effective strategies there is to decrease the incidence of heart attacks. And the last IOM report, oops, the last Institute of Medicine result, the Institute of Medicine report already concluded that if you ban smoking indoors, and by, by that I mean bars and restaurants and all closed workplaces, you will lead to a decrease in heart attack incidence. That the longer the ban is in place, the longer the drop is going to happen. So having that in mind, we talked with a legislator in Guatemala and asked her what is it that data she would be needing to move this policy forward. And she said, just, don't, just prove me that the problem is there. Just show me that there's a problem of nicotine exposure in public places. And this is what we did. We measured nicotine in hospitals, schools, universities, government buildings, airport, bars, and restaurants. And this was like, duh, obviously, if people are smoking inside bars and restaurants, you're going to find nicotine in these places. But having this in hand, we went back to Congress and said, we need a smoke-free law. And after three years in Congress, finally in 2009, uh, the Guatemala Congress passed a nationwide smoke-free ban. Does it work? Yes, it does. This is the nicotine levels uh, in restaurants before the ban, and this is after the ban. You saw the nicotine levels in bars before the ban, and these are the nicotine levels in bars six months after the ban. So banning smoking indoors actually works. Now the question is, does this decrease has also translated into a decrease in heart disease incidence and mortality in Guatemala? That's yet to be seen and it's something we need to document. Now the other project we're talking about and talk, talks a little bit more about the environment we Dr. Fernandez Brito was talking about. It's not only about the patient, but it's, so, it's much more about the environment. If someone wants to quit in Guatemala, can he do it? So we went out to pharmacies and evaluated if they would be able to find smoking cessation medication, and if they would, how much it would cost. First of all, it's really hard to find smoking cessation medications, and it would be probably easier for them to find cigarettes in a pharmacy uh, than finding smoking cessation, except for chain pharmacies, which would have both of them fairly, fairly frequently uh, compared to independent pharmacies or outside of Guatemala. So a smoker would have to visit four pharmacies before he could find one smoking cessation medication. Now what would happen when he, when he were to find it? This is the nicotine patch, the gum, arenicline, bupropion, and the least expensive medication. If he were to find it, the daily minimum cost, median cost of the minimum of the cheapest smoking cessation medication, which in this case would be the patch, would be approximately two and a half US dollars. That doesn't sound that bad, right? But considering the minimum wage in Guatemala, which is seven dollars per day, that's a lot of money. And when you compare the cost of the smoking cessation medication 
to the, to the cost of one cigarette pack, it's extremely cheaper to smoke than to try quitting smoking for seven days. So it tells you something about, much more about the environment and changing risk factors and changing behavior that it's more about the environment and about the individual uh, uh, perception. So to finish, uh, Guatemala is struggling with the double burden of disease, even though we're, we have an increasing uh, prevalence of NCDs, we still have to deal with a fair amount of infectious and infant mortality problems. There's a lack of political will to address the non-communicable disease epidemic. First of all, it's undocumented. We do not have very good epi epidemiologic longitudinal data that we could use to argue for stronger tobacco con NCD control programs and tobacco control programs. It's unfunded. So far, we have, re we have to rely on international funds, mainly from Canada, from the International Development Research Center, and from the NIH in the US, and we need to increase research capacity. Research is and will be fundamental to alter the N NCD epidemic. There's an urgent need to strengthen the research capacity in Guatemala. Not only that, but also we have to be responsible to turning the research we do into policy. Thank you very much.